schools. Uh, but no, it's good to be here today. Good to be able to come to God's house and worship. And as you know, uh, once a quarter, Adrian and myself go back and we teach children's church. And uh, so today is that opportunity for us, and we're going to go back and spend some time uh, with them looking at the woman who anointed Jesus' feet uh, with the perfume and her hair. And so we're looking forward to, to that story and just spending a little time uh, with our youth and our young ones. Uh, I am so happy and, and tickled that uh, Tommy Snowden, uh, been a, a brother of mine, literally he feels like a brother for a long, uh, long time. So we uh, grew up in the same church together. Uh, he's a little bit older than I am, but as long as I can remember, he was there. Uh, he was uh, my youth director. He led Adrian uh, to the Lord. He baptized Adrian and, and, uh, and just a tremendous uh, growing in Christ for a long, long time. I can't determine what he does better, sing or preach. Both are excellent and both will bless you. Now, at the same time, I don't know what's worse, a preaching singer or a singing preacher. <laughs> so, you know, you'll get a little taste of that this morning. <laughs> Uh, you gonna go away and leave me with that, huh? <laughs> well, good morning. I'll tell you one thing that I've noticed just after I was here with y'all this about this time last year. Um, y'all have grown. <laughs> Praise God. I love to see churches grow. Uh, and uh, yeah, Jason and I have known each other for a long, long time. Uh, a little over 40 years, I suppose it is now. Uh, when I got saved back in March 1981, I came to be with uh, Cardinal Village Springfield Baptist Church. And Jason's granddaddy, Brother Billy Jackson, was my pastor for 16 years. He was the Apostle Paul to my Timothy. And uh, and I remember Jason just a little bit fellow when I got there. And, and it's been such a delight to see the things that God has done through him uh, as, as he's grown older and and uh, responded to the call of the ministry. It's just such a delight to see what he's doing with you folks here. And, and I just know that God's got some things going on in the future for y'all. I'm not going to talk a long time because we need to get into the Word of God, and I don't want to keep y'all too late. Uh, but, well, I, honestly, I don't care how long I keep y'all, but I'm not going to. Uh, a long time ago, I got where I, I, I quit worrying about too much about time because it just amazes me. That, that folks don't have a problem sitting through three hours of a ball game or, you know, two hours of a musical in high school or, you know, they'll just sit right there. And some of the most uncomfortable seats you ever seen in your life. Uh, but yet, bring them to a church, sit them in a padded pew with air conditioning, and they'll get and start banging on their watches after 30 minutes, you know, they still can stop them. Uh, like the story I heard about the preacher that got up to preach and he took his watch off and laid it on the pulpit. And the boy sitting in the front pew with his daddy nudged his daddy with his elbow and said, Daddy, what does that mean? He said, not a thing in the world, son. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't always tell whether time's an issue or not, you know. But I'll tell you what, we won't go past the Holy Spirit. How about that? <laughs> uh, I do want to invite you folks to something coming up. And since y'all are starting revival on the 25th, I'm really excited about this. Uh, the Lord began to move in my spirit about six months ago about doing this, and uh, I personally don't know how you folks feel, but I feel like it's time for us to put this Chinese virus behind us and uh, get this pestilence out of the way. I mean, you know, it may be with us for a long time in the form of like a common cold or something like that, but I think the danger is pretty well past. Some of the liberals don't want us to think that, but it is. And, uh, and so in so doing, I'm believing God for us to have a real dynamite, uh, old-fashioned, heartfelt, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent, God-loving, Jesus-loving revival meeting. We're going to have it the 24th of September at my church, Kellum Baptist Church in Jacksonville at 6.30. That's Saturday night at 6.30. Celebrate Jesus 2022. And if y'all can make it, we'd love to see you out there. Uh, my team's going to consist of uh, King's Grace, the group that I mentioned a while ago, and also His Redeemed. And I know we're going to have a grand old time in the Lord, and I just love to see y'all come. Celebrate Jesus 2022. 
I'm going to send uh, Jason a flyer and he'll, he'll probably flash it up there on your screen a time or two before it gets here, okay? And that will get y'all started before you start your revival Sunday night, right? With Brother Sandy Bain. And I got news for you. If you hadn't heard him preach, you're in for a surprise and you're in for a blessing. Amen? Amen. Well, like Jason said, I'm a singing preacher. Not a preaching singer. I'm a singing preacher. That is a difference. And, and uh, this song here has been a, a blessing to my soul. I love this song. It's got a beautiful message. And I do hope that it speaks to your heart as well. Uh, because it talks about the sovereignty of God in creation and how it connects up with the gospel. If you'll listen to the words, please.
thank you, Father, that in your mind, according to the Word of God, in the economy of God, Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world. The Calvary is not plan B with you. It was always plan A. And Lord, I just want to thank you so much for that sacrifice that was made on that cross so many years ago. Even though it was so many years ago, the story is still fresh in our minds who know him and who have accepted him as the Lord of our lives. For those, Father, who have not, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to speak to our hearts through the Word of God for the next few moments. Be glorified, we pray, Father, in any decisions that are made. And I'm asking you by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to take the Word and let it find a lodging place in the heart of each and every person here today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you open your Bibles this morning, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, this is sometimes referred to in some circles by some uh, preachers, theologians, whatever you want to call them, uh, the Know Ye Not chapter. Because in the 6th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says six times, Do you not know, or know you not? Or, as we would say in Eastern North Carolina, don't you know? Uh, and there are six very important things here that the Apostle Paul was trying to get over to this church of Corinth. Now, now the church of Corinth is what I call uh, Paul's prodigal church or, uh, I guess, incorrigible church, delinquent church, whatever you want to say, you know, concerning disobedience because obviously they had some problems in this church. Interestingly enough, Paul spent a year and a half planting this church, this, the, the narrative concerning the foundation of this church can be found in Acts chapter 18. Where Paul, after leaving Athens, uh, some of you may remember that sermon that he preached on Mars Hill in Athens. And after he left Athens, he came further down the Grecian peninsula toward the Peloponnesus, which is that section of Greece that juts out from the mainland uh, into the Aegean Sea. And there was a seaport city there by the name of Corinth. And this city, if you don't know anything about this city, this city was a very, very wicked city. Uh, it was a seaport city, and so consequently there was a lot of maritime activity that went on there. Uh, ships came and went, and any time you have a, a, a maritime seaport, trust me, you're going to have sin. Okay, 13 years in the Marine Corps, went on three med cruises, and I've been to several seaports in the Mediterranean Sea, from Naples, Italy, to Sigonella, Sicily, to uh, uh, Toulon, France, uh, and you name it, I've been there. I've been to Venice, I've been to uh, Capitulata, Sardinia, and it seems like any seaport you go to, there's going to be some wicked, ungodly activity. Amen? That's just the way it is. And, uh, and, and I'm not happy to say, I'm not proud to say, thank God Jesus washed it all away in His blood, but I used to take part in some of that wicked, ungodly activity. And some of you I see nodding your head may have done the same thing. Okay? Uh, but there was a great deal of wickedness in the city of Corinth. So much to the point that it was said of a person that lived an ungodly, wicked uh, immoral lifestyle back in the first century uh, time period that they were living like a Corinthian. And so that was not a complimentary statement, by the way, if you told somebody they were living like a Corinthian. How many of you ever heard somebody say you talk like a sailor? Okay, well that's not a complimentary statement to the Navy. What that's doing is that's saying that you got a filthy mouth. Uh, so when somebody said you're living like a Corinthian, it meant that you have an immoral, wicked, unethical, uh, sinful lifestyle. So Paul had to deal with this. When he got down to Corinth, the first thing he did was he, he encountered a couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. These were Jewish uh, couple that had been exiled or uh, sent packing from Rome by Claudius when he decided to let all the Jews go uh, out of Rome. And so they traveled down to Corinth. And he found them there. They were of the same occupation that Paul was. They were tent makers. And so uh, Paul struck up a friendship with these two uh, uh, people and 
evidently converted them to Christianity. They got saved and they began to follow Paul. Priscilla and Aquila we see again in the book of Romans. Uh, obviously, they started a church in their own house. Uh, and so Paul also encountered another gentleman by the name of Crispus and evidently his wife Gaius. And somehow or another, a church was planted, most likely in their home. Paul stayed in the city of Corinth for a year and a half, preaching the gospel and telling them about Jesus Christ and converting them. At one point, as a matter of fact, while Paul was suffering great persecution, the Spirit of God spoke to Paul one night and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. I have many people in this city. Now, isn't that ironic? That the most wicked city, uh, comprising the most wicked people in the world, is a place where the Spirit of God says, I have many people here in this city. Now that doesn't necessarily mean these people were already saved, but what it does mean is, if they weren't, they're going to be. And so, one of the most prominent churches in the Bible can be found there in Corinth. As a matter of fact, the two letters that Paul wrote, 1 and 2 Corinthians, are two of the largest epistles in the New Testament. Now, after Paul left Corinth, he began to travel into Syria and eventually went, in, went on his way into Israel and left Corinth behind. But he had some people uh, that he left behind that would send him reports. And so the first letter to the Corinthians is a result of the first report that he received. And some of the things that they were doing in that church were absolutely shameful. Well, in the first place, one of the things he had to deal with was he had, was he had to deal with division, right? Right? He said, it's reported unto me by them of the house of Chloe that there are divisions among you. And, and these divisions should not be. Some of you say I am of Paul. Some of you say I am of Apollo. Some of you say I am of Cephas or Peter. And some of you say I am Christ. He said, Did I were you baptized in my name? He said, were you baptized in the name of Apollos or Peter? He said, I'm thankful I didn't baptize any of you except for Christmas and Gaius. He said, I do believe I might have, might have baptized Stephanie, but as far as I know, I didn't baptize. You know, Paul didn't keep score. He wasn't one of these that put notches on his gun. You know what I'm saying? So that he could brag to everybody about all the things that he'd done for God. He left that up to the Lord. Uh, so they had divisions in the church. Uh, another thing that they had was they had immorality in the church. You read on in the fifth chapter, and he talks about this man who is having adultery with his daddy's wife. Now what kind of something is that going on inside the church of Christ? And he said, y'all been, been proud about this thing. You've been boastful about it. You've been puffed up about it instead of dealing with the situation. I'll tell you something, folks. This is something that we can learn today. If there's one thing that the church needs to learn is how to accurately, properly conduct church discipline. Because we're letting too much ungodly stuff seep into the church and happen in the church. And I know there's some folks that say, well, I know, you know, judge not lest you be judged and, and all that stuff. So we just let everybody go from horse thieves on down. And I'll tell you something, folks, that is not the will of God for the church of Jesus Christ. There is a time when things need to be dealt with in the church. Jesus said that. He said, if you see your brother sin, do what? Ignore it? Sweep it under the rug? Turn your back on it? Hope somebody else sees it and does something about it? No. He said, if you see your brother sin, you go to him in private. And you, which are spiritual, the Apostle Paul said, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering your own self, lest you also be tempted. Now, he said, if they receive your word, you've won your brother. If they haven't, take one or two more. So that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything may be established. He didn't say put it on Facebook, social media, and all this other claptrap or whatever the rest of this stuff is called. He said, go to them and deal with them personally, one-on-one, -on -one, nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball, and do it in love. Don't do it judgmentally. Don't do it uppity. Don't do it, you know, condescendingly, but do it in love. He said, ye which are spiritual, right? That's important. And then he said, if they don't repent, then he said, bring it before the church. Let the pastor and elders deal with it, okay? That needs to be done more often than it is, folks, and that's all there is to it. Amen or oh me, but that's so. And so, 
He was dealing with that situation. He told them they needed to deal with that. Then he was dealing with the, the false teachers in the church. He was dealing with people that were not exercising the spiritual gifts properly. He was dealing with people that weren't even properly conducting the communion service. So he had some problems in that church, right? And so when he was writing this letter in the sixth chapter, this is where we're going to get to this morning. I want you to begin reading in verse 9 with me. Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. In other words, don't let anybody fool you about this. Don't let anybody trick you about this. Don't, don't be blinded by this. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now, what is Paul saying here? He said, first of all, he said, I can't believe that you folks don't know. I was with you for a year and a half teaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, telling you about Jesus and the word of God, and you don't know that unrighteous folks won't go to heaven? You don't, don't you know that people that don't live right don't go to heaven? And, and, and folks, you know, it amazes me that people in the church don't realize that. Some folks that don't know God, some people that ain't saved know more about how a Christian should live than Christians do. How many times have you ever had an unbeliever tell you, you're supposed to be a Christian and you do that? You're supposed to be a Christian and you say that? I mean, it's like that, it's like that, that sailor to come to uh, uh, Jonah when he was down there in the sea. He come to him, he said, what are you doing sleeping? You're a prophet of God. You need to be dealing with this situation. And here you are sleeping. You know, and so Paul is, is telling this church that people that don't live right don't go to heaven. Now there are three things about this passage I want us to see. Three things that I believe the Spirit of God and the Apostle Paul is presuming or assuming about the reader of this passage or the hearer of this passage. Three things. Number one, the Spirit of God presumes that the person that reads this passage or hears this passage believes in a concept of righteousness. Believes in it. Now, that's interesting because we live in a world today that has no concept of righteousness. This modern, liberal, anything-goes society that we live in where, you know, I'm okay and you're okay, and, you know, we've got this social gospel. And this social gospel is not a gospel at all, folks. It's the enemy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's being taught by by ungodly people, and, and a lot of them have crept into the church. And the problem with the social gospel is the social gospel says, well, do the best you can. The problem with that is the gospel says the best you can ain't good enough. <coughs> All of our righteousness, according to the book of Isaiah, is what? As filthy rags in the sight of God. Nothing we do is good enough. You can't do the best you can and please God. Religion is man's effort to reach a holy God by the works of his own hands, and you never will. You can't do it. Because the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The social gospel says do the best you can. The, Bible, the gospel says your best ain't good enough, and it never will be. Amen? Amen. The social gospel says you're owed something. That, that you're a victim and the world owes you. That's what the social gospel wants you to believe. That God owes you. And let me tell you what the gospel says. The gospel says we are not victims, but rather we're the villains. The greatest victim of all of humanity and of all history was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only man that ever lived that was accused unjustly. Tried unjustly, condemned unjustly, and put to death unjustly by man. Now, what man did not know is he was not executed, he was sacrificed. 
Jesus' death was not an execution, folks. It was a sacrifice. The, the social gospel doesn't accept that. The social gospel doesn't accept that we're, that we're villains. The social gospel says we're victims and that the world owes us. And let me tell you something. The only thing that we have owed to us is all of eternity in a boiling, bubbling, blistering, burning lake of fire. That's what we have owed to us. Amen? Amen. And so, uh, Paul says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So this presuming here is that there is, there is an understanding of the concept of righteousness. Now, the problem with righteousness is most folks don't understand what the word means because they don't understand what the root word is. The word righteous does not mean perfect. The word righteous does not mean sinless. The word righteous doesn't mean lily white. Nobody will ever attain to sinless perfection in this life. I don't care who says that you will. You will not. If that were so, then the Bible would not have given us such passages as, He that confesses his sin shall have mercy and grace with God. If we confess our sin, we, He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he's not talking to unsaved folks there, folks. He's talking to, to Christians. He's talking to children of God in 1 John chapter 1. And so the concept of righteousness is not that concept of being perfect. It's a concept of being upright and in right standing with God. And how do we get upright and in right standing with God? We've already established you can't do it by works of your own hands. You'll never do enough. So how do we get that way? The only way we can be upright and right standing with God is through the blood that Jesus Christ shed on Calvary's cross. And by faith in Him and the sacrifice that He made, we are made righteous. That's what the Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when it says, He hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Glory to God. I'm here this morning standing before you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not because of who I am or anything that I've done, but because everything He is and all that He has done. Amen? And if you're here this morning and you've made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God and you know for a fact that heaven is your home, then you also are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I don't care how you feel. Somebody said, I don't feel righteous. Well, I don't care how you feel. Well, my wife don't say I'm righteous. Well, I don't care what she says. Well, my youngins don't think I'm righteous. Well, I don't care what they say. The Bible said that if we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It was imputed unto us, conveyed on us, if you will, like knighthood by a king to a squire. Amen? It's something that you don't deserve, but it's something that He has given you freely by His grace. Amen? Praise God. Now, I don't know what that does for you, but it just fills me with joy that to know that it's nothing that I've done, but everything that He's done. Amen? So, the concept of righteousness is to be upright and in right standing with God. Now, number two is, the passage presumes that the reader believes in a kingdom of God. Notice what it said. The unrighteous shall not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. So it presumes that there is a kingdom of God, or in some passages it says kingdom of heaven. There is a kingdom of heaven to inherit. Amen. Amen. And that the reader believes that. The reader understands that there is a heaven to, to, to want to be in, to want to go to. Amen. And I assume that everybody in this church this morning has a desire to go to heaven or you wouldn't be here. Now granted, there may be some of you young people sitting here because a girlfriend invited you or a boyfriend invited you. There may be some of you husbands here because your wife drug you here. And there may be some wives. And there may be some wives here because their husbands drug them here. It may not be the most high holy reason to be here, but I do believe that each and every one of you, in some place inside of you, have a belief that there is a heaven to gain. And if there is a heaven to gain, then we also believe that there is a hell to shun. Amen? Because the Bible, the same Bible teaches about heaven, teaches about hell. As a matter of fact, for every one time Jesus mentioned heaven, he mentioned hell seven times. 
So I got a feeling, a sneaky suspicion that it's important. Amen? If I did not believe that there was a hell fire waiting for those who don't know Jesus Christ when they die, I would never preach another a sermon in my life. If, there, if I didn't believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, I'd close this Bible and never preach again. But I, with all my heart, believe. And that's why I do what I do. That's why Jason does what he does. That's why every preacher does what he does. I hope. So, there is a belief in this concept of a kingdom of heaven to inherit. Now, notice the word inherit. Inherit. That is not something that you earn. It's not something that you take by force. It's not something that you buy and pay for. It is something that comes to you through somebody else's will. Amen? How, what do you got, any of you in, in, in your mom or daddy's will or, or anything, or if you know you are, what do you have to do to inherit an estate from a loved one? What do you have to do? Not a thing in the world. Just be alive when they die. Amen? Jesus, the only man that ever lived, that made a will, that's the new covenant, made a will, died, and rose again from the dead to execute his own will and testament. Praise God. That's what the New Testament is. It's, his, it's Jesus' last will and testament. Praise God. And we inherit that will and testament through faith in him. And it says that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God because you can't go to heaven if you don't live right. Just that simple. If you are not upright and in right standing with God, you can't go to heaven. And then the third thing that the Spirit of God presumes is, is that the reader and the hearer of this passage has a desire to go to this place called heaven. And folks, honestly, before God, after 41 years, I have grown weary, honestly weary, of going around trying to take people's nose and stick it down in a water bucket and make them drink that ain't thirsty. Honestly, before God, you are wasting your time when you try to do that. The Bible said that. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give that which is good to dogs. You know what that means? That just simply means don't waste your time on folks who don't want to hear what you've got to say. If they're going to be argumentative about it, if they're going to be abrasive about it, if they're going to be uh, you know, debating everything that you say, don't waste your time. Do what Paul did. Shake the dust off your feet and go find somebody that wants to hear it. Amen? Let somebody else come along. Paul said, I planted the seed. Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. Praise God. Now don't misunderstand me, folks. I'm not saying give up on them. What I'm saying is don't argue until you're blue in the face with somebody that don't want to hear anything you've got to say. Because there's somebody out there that does. Amen? And i got to believe that everybody here not only believes in the concept of heaven, but has a desire to go there. Now, Paul lists these things saying that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He begins, he says, be not deceived, neither fornicators. Now, the first thing on the list is fornicate, and that's just simply uh, illicit, promiscuous, uh, prostitutional sexual activity that takes place. Men, women, boys, girls, men and men, women, women, it doesn't matter. Anything that is illicit, prostitutional, of a physical nature of intimacy is fornication. Anything that is outside of the confines of holy wedlock. And that holy wedlock, my brother and sister, is between a man and a woman. Paul said uh, that to avoid fornication, let every man have his wife and let every woman have her husband. Now that should wrap it up right there. Man, his wife, woman, her husband. Amen? I mean, I don't understand why folks are having this gender identity problem. I really don't. I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's pretty simple to me, you know. And I mean, we're living in the world of this DEI, D -E -I, uh, what, the diversity, exclusion, and in inclusion, or equity and inclusion. Yeah, I remember when DEI stood for Dale Earnhardt Industries. <laughs> And I don't understand this identity problem that folks got. Kids, do not let these people confuse you. You were born a boy. You will live as a boy. You will die as a boy. You'll stand before God as a boy. Girls, you were born a girl. You're going to live as a girl. You're going to die as a girl, and you're going to stand before God as a girl. 
Somebody said, well, what happens if they get an operation? Folks, let me tell you something. You can surgically put a trunk on my face, but that don't make me an elephant. <laughs> It's just that simple. I don't understand what the problem is. Neither fornicators nor idolaters. That's people that bow down to foreign gods. And, and the gods that they bow down to, there's a pantheon of them. Some of you kids probably learned about it in high school. I mean, you know, the Romans and the Greeks, they were, they were polytheists. They believe in a whole bunch of different gods, right? And I mean, the Romans just plagiarized the, the, the Greeks. They just named them different names, but they were the same, the same deities, right? Entities, whatever you want to call them. They didn't exist. They weren't real. But, I mean, they called them by, the, by different names, but they were the same thing. They used to have a god they'd worshipped back in those days called Plutos. Now, Plutos was the god of wealth and prosperity and money, right? And jewels and all this other thing. Uh, the accumulation of wealth and things. And we don't call him Plutos anymore, now it's just a long piece of paper with a dead president's picture on it. But it's the same God. And we got folks dying and going to hell worshiping that God. Sacrificing their spiritual well-being to that God. And the whole time they're doing that, trying to spend their lives in the accumulation of things. Every, every, you know, people, in every stage of life, they're putting things in a box. Right? We start out as kids... We put our toys in a box. We grow up a little bit older, we get bigger boxes. Some of you girls may have had a hope chest when you were growing up. Some of you may still have one if they still use that concept. I don't know if they do or don't. But you put stuff in a hope chest. You put stuff in toolboxes. You put stuff in safety deposit boxes. You spend your life putting stuff in boxes until the only thing that's going to be in a box is you. And all these things that you've accumulated over your life is going to belong to somebody else. Because the last time I looked, the last funeral procession I looked at, there wasn't a U-Haul trailer running around behind that hearse. Amen. Somebody, that's like the fellas that were looking at a funeral and one guy looked at the, the hearse going by and it was a very, very wealthy man in the community. He said, I wonder how much he left. He said, he left it all. <laughs> Amen. And Jesus said that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. But we've got people that are sacrificing their lives, their spiritual well-being, to accumulate wealth and things and stuff only to leave it for somebody else. It will never satisfy. So you're still bowing down to the same God, Plutus. And they had another god called Bacchus. He was the, he was the god of, of wine and strong drink. We don't call him Bacchus anymore. No, we call him Paps, Blue Ribbon, Budweiser, Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, or some other, you know, wild turkey or whatever. You know, we don't call him by the same name, but it's the same god. And people are bowing down to that god this day. And in this list that Paul lists here, on this list is drunkards. And that is people that use alcoholic beverage in order to, uh, to, to get some kind of euphoria or whatever, you know, to, to feel the effects of that alcohol. And I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. If you ever saw a preacher that believes in uh, abstinence where alcohol is concerned, you're staring right at it. I believe with all my heart that it is not the will of God for any of his children to drink alcohol in any type of beverage form, recreationally speaking. Unless it's for medicinal purposes, I don't believe God wants you to touch it at all. And if it was my, if I had the, the uh, decision to make here, we'd go back to prohibition. Now somebody said, preacher, that's a little radical, isn't it? I mean, you can't do away with all the alcohol by making it illegal. No, I can't do that at all. You're right. I can't. But I'll tell you something else, too. I can't do away with all the skunks in the world either, but I'm not going to make a house cat out of one. <laughs> Let's leave them out in the woods where they belong. Amen? And I'll tell you something right now. I used to, I'm not proud of it, but I used to drink alcohol. But in 1981, March of 1981, I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And since that day, I have not touched alcohol willingly for any reason at all. At all. I just quit it. I gave it up. 
Somebody said, what program did you use? The Holy Ghost. <laughs> I just quit. I told the Lord, this ain't pleasing to you, and I, I'm not going to do it anymore. And I'll tell you another thing too, folks. I'd have never been won to God by somebody that did. I believe with all my heart that it will wreck and ruin your testimony. It will keep you from being fruitful and effective in the service of God if you drink. And we'll leave that alone. So all these gods that they used to worship, idolatry. The next is adultery. Okay? Now, adultery is anything that is outside of the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. Like I said, any, any type of intimacy that is outside of the confines of marriage. God believes in the institution of marriage. It is the first institution that God started in the Bible. It was between Adam and Eve. Amen? For this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And so anything outside of that relationship is adultery. Adulterers don't inherit the kingdom of God, folks. Uh, and then he goes on to say, nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. You look it up, folks. That's homosexuality. Plain and simple. And I don't care what the world says. I don't care what Washington says. I don't care what the liberal church says, the social gospel says. I don't care what uh, what what pastor says in whatever church, the Bible says they're locked out of the kingdom of God. You can let them in. You can put them on the roll. You can make Sunday school teachers out of them. You can make deacons out of them. You can even ordain them and make pastors out of them. God says they're locked out of the kingdom of God. And don't sit there and look at me at that tone of voice, folks. I didn't write this. Nor feminine, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves. No covetous. Now, we could spend a long time on that, but there's a whole lot of thieves in the church, believe it or not. If you don't believe me, maybe you might want to look at the tithe and offering, offerings list. No, you don't. Trust me. The book of Malachi says, You rob God when you don't give to Him that which is due. <clears throat> Just that simple. He said, You are robbing me, this whole nation, in tithes and offerings. And then he went on to say, prove me herewith. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse. And prove me herewith, saith the Lord. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and, and pour out upon you a blessing that you'll not be able to receive it, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. God wants to lavish upon his people, but his people are being stingy. And they won't let him. Thieves. Covetous. Which, by the way, is the root of thievery. Want what other folks got. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. Half of the marriages in this country are ending in divorce. So don't tell me that people don't want what other folks got. That's the reason for the wars that are going on around this world today. Because folks want what other folks got. Nor covetous, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Now this is not a comprehensive list. And let me say this too. These things are not what keep people out of heaven. The passage doesn't say that. It's not the things that these people are doing that keeps them out of heaven. It's the fact that they're not righteous. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not that they're unrighteous because they do these things. They do these things because they are not in right standing with God. You understand what I'm saying here? Let me tell you something, folks. When I got saved 41 years ago, I used to drink. I used to smoke. I used to cuss. I told dirty jokes. I was in the Marine Corps. I did things that I wasn't proud of. I mean, I really did some bad things. Somebody said, well, how bad were they? None of your business. <laughs> That's between me and God. But I'm just saying, as I lived a life that was not pleasing to God, and it, wasn't, and it wasn't really doing me any good. Amen? But I didn't do the... I wasn't unrighteous because I did those things. I did those things because I didn't know Jesus. I wasn't saved. I was not born again. I had not been regenerated. When I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life, I quit that junk. I 
give it up. I had a Damascus Road experience, folks. In one night, my life was completely changed. I walked into the office the next morning, into the line shack, the next morning carrying a Bible. And the guys looked at me and said, Sergeant Snowden, is that you? I said, yes. I said, what's that in your hand? I said, it's the Bible. Now, this Bible was an old hardback Gideon Bible they gave me when I was in the Marine Corps, shoved it in the bottom of my sea bag, and it had been there for five years. But I finally dug the thing out. The night I got saved and I started carrying it around with me, they said, what are you doing with the Bible? I said, I'm glad you asked, fellas. Sit down. Let me tell you what happened to me last night. <laughs> Glory to God. And 40 years has come and gone. I've never had to work up a sermon. Never had to work up a, a, a testimony, praise God. It's always there. It's, it's like Peter said, being ready to give an account of what? The hope that lieth within you with joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. Hallelujah. I don't know if I'm doing you any good, but I'm preaching me happy. <laughs> glory to God. My watch stopped. What time is it? <laughs> if I got to quit, hey, I guess I better. Jason will be coming out here. <laughs> Praise God forevermore. The unrighteous are unrighteous because they're not in right standing with God. And that's why they do these things. When you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, He changed you. Amen? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Praise God forevermore. And so he goes on to say, and I'm going to finish with this point. Like a fat man going through the barbed wire fence, one more point and I'm through. <laughs> Paul said, and such were some of you. Look, I don't know the life that you lived before you got saved. But you do. God, in his wisdom, has allowed us to remember where we came from. He's allowed us to remember the life that we lived before we got saved. He did not wipe that out of our thinking and out of our memories. Why? So that we wouldn't go back to it. Amen? I don't know the life that you live. I don't know what you've done. And like I said a while ago, it's none of my business. If you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, according to Paul, you'd have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. He has washed us from our sins in His own blood, according to Revelation chapter 1. Amen. And so, we have been washed by the blood of Jesus. And you are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God daily, daily sanctifies us and keeps us holy and separate from the world, the flesh, and the devil. If we will let Him but I'm going to tell you something, folks. He's not going to make you do anything. He's a gentleman. He will let you do what you want to do. But if you let him, he will keep you pure. He will keep you clean. He will keep you holy. Amen? You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. Which means it's just as if you had never sinned. Praise God. Somebody said, my sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. No, they're not. The Bible said they are remitted by the blood of Jesus, which means they are washed away. They no longer exist anymore. The devil is standing there with a blank sheet of paper right now. <laughs> there is nothing on it. Our sins were washed in his blood. It is through his blood that we have been remitted of our sins. Praise God. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved by the grace of God, you, you don't know this concept of forgiveness and mercy and grace. You don't know for a fact that if you died right now, heaven would be your home. Listen to me, folks. Nobody's going to wake up in heaven and be surprised they got there. I'm going to say that again. Nobody <coughs> is going to wake up in heaven and be surprised they got there. If you don't know for a fact that you're saved and on your way to heaven, the odds are that you are not. But I got good news for you, folks. You can know it before you leave the service this morning. All you need to do is just receive the mercy and the grace that God has extended toward you through Jesus and through the sacrifice that He made on Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. 
And by faith believe that not only did he die, but he rose again three days later, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And when you become a partner with him, by faith, you become partners with him in that conquest over death. Death will no longer have any power over you. Praise God forevermore. If you're here this morning and you don't know for a fact that you're saved, you can know it before you leave this service this morning. I'd like every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody will be praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, sir, I've done everything I know to do to preach this message to your people in a way that will be pleasing to you and edifying to them. And Father, I just pray right now by your Holy Spirit that you will do what man cannot do, that you will speak to each heart, men, women, boys, and girls, concerning their relationship with you, convict of sin where there is sin. And Father, anyone here this morning who is not saved by the mercy of God and by the grace of God, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to their hearts and draw them to a right relationship with you before it's everlasting too late, that nobody will leave the service this morning with a burden of sin on their heart when they can find mercy and forgiveness with you. If there's anybody here who's backslidden on you and grown cold and indifferent toward the things of God, maybe they've just lost the wonder of it all. Maybe there's someone here that has unconfessed and unrepented of sins in their life and they need to deal with them. Father, in Jesus' name, please, sir, please, Speak to hearts and be glorified in any decisions that are made in the next few moments. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand up on your feet, please, musicians? Please come.